let's uh, get the morning started. I want to thank you all for joining us. Um, this is supposed to be a physical event, our exchange breakfast, female entrepreneurship and investors. Uh, but fortunately for us, we were able to digitalize it. So I'm really glad that you guys were all able to join. Um, we'll kind of come to um, some of the challenges we all had to probably face in the last two weeks in order to even sit in front of the laptop. But I want to welcome all the attendees as well, coming in, tell you a little bit about what German Tech does. Um, what we do is we inspire, build, and grow digital ecosystems for a sustainable future. And one of the things we do is we have a World Changers in Tech platform. And on this platform, we usually have um, our events, which are meetups, our open lectures. And now we also had the exchange breakfast in mind. And due to Corona and the circumstances, we obviously had to cancel the physical meeting, but are very happy that we can welcome everyone to attend, especially because it enables us to have people join us that aren't necessarily physically in Berlin, which I find exciting about having everything be uh, digitized. Um, for the event itself, we want to make this interactive with our audience. So I do have a few things I just want to explain to you. Um, at the bottom, if you're attending, at the bottom of your screen, there's a Q&A box where you can ask questions regarding the gen like general questions. You can type those in there and I'll try to address them uh, during or at the end. However, there's also a cute little symbol that says, raise your hand. The raise your hand symbol will allow you to ask a specific question once I've asked the panelists a question. And if you raise your hand, we will enable your voice. So you will actually be able to ask a real live question. And this was important to us that we, you know, test this format to see if we can get more people involved. Um, and we're gonna just raise her hand. Someone just raised their hand. So, but yeah. what we're gonna do now, we're gonna do a little test with the people that are attending. Um, how many of you are female? Yep, we're getting the hands, we're getting the hands. I mean, obviously, so that's us. <laughs> so there's 11. Oh, more, there's more coming in. What's working, okay. Takes a little time, so this must, must be the lag. So we're about 15 females with the panelists. Other questions, is there anyone aboard that's a male? Raise your hand. Four, okay. How many are, now you gotta, I'll lower all hands. Lower all hands. How many are entrepreneurs? We have seven who have raised their hands. I don't know, the rest of you can't actually see the raised hands, right? The panelists? Okay, so there are seven who raised, raised their hands as entrepreneurs. I'm gonna lower all hands again. How many of you are in the investment landscape? VC or an angel investor? Oh. I have to, 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 so there's three right now. Monique, Jenny, okay, Fabian, great. Um, towards the end, we also want you guys to be able to network with each other. So entrepreneurs, investors, I'll do a call out if anyone wants to try to talk to each other. We're, we're gonna try different methods so we can get you guys engaged with each other. Okay, thank you guys for um, testing out our little raised hand part. Now uh, we will go over to our wonderful panelists. Thank you for joining us, being part of the breakfast. I would like to have each and one of you kind of tell us, just tell us quickly who you are, um, who are you representing today, and what is the one breakfast item that you cannot miss out on? So we'll start with Maria, and then we'll go Maria, Leonie, Maxi, Fabiola. But Maria, why don't you go ahead? Hi. Um, I'm Maria, and I just learned yesterday that I keep rocking back and forth when I'm on video calls. <laughs> I realized that I'm doing it again, so I'll try to be still now. Um, I'm one of the managing directors of German Tech, uh, and I just explained uh, what we did, so I don't want to spend too much time um, on that. And my um, breakfast item 
is, uh, I think, coffee, of course. I did not have a coffee machine before uh, Corona hit us. Um, I was drinking my coffee outside in all the coffees, coffee shops around here. I live in uh, Berlin Mitte. Um, so when, <laughs> when we decided that we go uh, all into home office, I had to organize a coffee machine, which now leads to me having my fourth coffee today and drinking way too much coffee. But I cannot do it. I cannot survive without it. Okay. <clears throat> So uh, my name is Leonie and I represent Grace Accelerate Female Entrepreneurship. Um, we have different formats, programs and initiatives um, for female entrepreneurs. So that's our main focus. And um, I think at the heart of Grace is our summer camp program, which is a two and a half weeks program for women who want to start their company. So it's really, really early stage. Um, and so far, I think we have 12 or 14 startups that came out of it and um, this time it's going to be the third time and um, i'm live out of kreuzberg at the moment uh, that's where i live um, so we are also in our home offices of course i really do miss this human interaction but i think it's great and thanks for a uh, great and thanks for setting up this um this call here um, because I think it's really important to stay in touch and um, getting also this exchange going um, digitally. Um, so, and I agree with you, Maria, um, coffee is also my best friend in the morning. Uh, I usually don't eat in the mornings. Um, I'm just not hungry, <laughs> but that's probably because I have late dinner usually. Um, so yeah, coffee is my um, most important item in the morning and the first thing I do when I get up actually. <laughs> And can I ask you one question, Leonie? Are you planning to do the batches just as planned? Because you said you will have the next one. <clears throat> yeah, so the program is planned for August. Okay. Um, and we stay optimistic that we can do it by then. Um, we also started the application process, which is digital anyway. So um, people can apply for it already. Mm -hmm. um, and as of now, we're still planning to do it in August, yes. Maxi. Maxi. Hello, morning. Um, so I can start. I'm getting nervous. I'm usually never nervous on stage, but this is a completely new situation. I'm talking to people and I have no interaction of the people viewing. So that's a bit confusing. Um, my name is Maxi and I'm a serial entrepreneur. I founded two companies. One is Rubicop. That's basically the first sustainable period company in Germany. And the second one is Femina Health. It's a telemedicine platform where women get medical advice and they can get their hormones that got uh, tested uh, from home. So it's home testing and um, online health consultations at the moment only in Germany. And yeah, that's about me. Corona, I think, for me personally, has two sides. One is it, it's extremely stressful to uh, manage family and work. Luckily, my partner, he has a kind of a flexible job, so we do 50-50. But my children have been sick for the last month, every two weeks, basically. I have twins and they uh, infect each other constantly. Um, but I think Corona, what it did to me as well, is that it's somehow an Entschleunigungsprozess. So yeah, you really, uh, usually my life is extremely um, durchgetaktet. It's uh, like you run in the morning, get children ready, you run to Kita, you run to work, you run back, you do meetings. And I think this whole Corona episode makes me <sighs> calm down. I enjoyed my coffee before I joined this call. I, I, I talked to my children this morning. We all had coffee together. So the family somehow unites, reunites again and has more time together. And I think that's, that's a very positive aspect of this whole situation. So I think there's two sides to it. That's like so my two cents. So you, you, um, you already got the second question that I was gonna throw into the round. What's the one thing for breakfast? that you can't live without? Is it the coffee or is it something else? I never eat breakfast either. I always make a, a really nice uh, cafe latte. I don't have a coffee machine, Maria, but we do have very good coffee. I think that's very important as well. And I have a free, freshly squeezed orange uh, grapefruit juice here on my side. 
All right, so Fabiola in Schleswig-Holstein. Yes, hello. Um, yes, I'm Fabiola. I'm one of the founders of AUXO and um, AUXO is a female funded um, investor. And we started off with the thesis, we started off last year thinking about um, founding a first gender lens fund in Germany. So we spoke to a lot of female founders and um, that's how we know you, Leonie, very well from Grace. Um, and um, and Maxi, we've also already met. So the um, and started off with the thesis as to saying that the typical investor is um, is is male and overlooks certain topics, namely topics where women are customers or decision makers, and he also overlooks female founders. And the statistics show that. Um, and that's how we started off. But we, um, in talking to many entrepreneurs, we realized that the gap is probably even bigger in, um, for founders who want to build what we call um, sustainable growth investments versus exponential growth. And um, so we, Corona is now changing that a little bit, but we were about to start a fundraising um, sort of with a slightly different pitch, not purely gender based, but um, Sorry, it's telling me, that's why it's making me really nervous that it's telling me constantly that my internet is not stable. I hope you can I hear me. You. We can hear yeah. you just fine. We can hear you just fine. And actually, Fabiola, yeah. why, don't you, why don't you continue on that note? Because yeah. um, the next uh, question I wanted to pose to everyone is how has Corona, you know, changed your work situation and your life situation? Like, how are you dealing with it? And um, if there's one, is there one hack that's keeping you sane during these times? Um, I think my one hack is, um, is despite kind of we, all of us isolating ourselves, is realizing that um, the, the sort of how strong relationships are and how close they are. And I think Maxi, you put it quite well, that it's a nice, in a way for us as a family, it's, um, it means we have a lot of time together. And sort of um, I'm keeping sane by, um, family together had a few days on her own at when it was talk about Switzerland closing borders that was really my um, I found the hardest sort of trying to get her back but um, but also in terms of business that I think it's um, I, for me it's having my two AUXO partners and Corona is meaning we we are probably going to have to change our whole strategy because if you look at um, at how fundraisings work, it's, um, I don't want to bore you with the details, but it's, um, it's going to take courage to start a fundraising whilst people are assuming that it's going to be the worst financial crisis we've seen, which, but again, it's a matter of looking at the opportunities that allows also. So what we, as also we are saying, we need to wait for a few weeks until the situations, until kind of we have more clarity but in the meanwhile yes my one hack is um is the support supporting each other in best way you can wonderful and maybe maria you can continue in terms of um maybe you know how's german tech business your life and your hack yeah so so my life is, is kind of different to uh, to what maxi and fabiola just um uh, just explained because i live on my own uh, I, I don't have any kids, so that means uh, literally I'm here in this room alone for for all the 24 24 seven. No, I go to my to my sleeping room to sleep though. But I'm in the apartment. Um, I do go out for short walks uh, during lunchtime, but not talking to anybody in person, not um, meeting anybody, of course. Um, so it changed the way I socially interact but I do not feel lonely or um, alone um, because I get up in the morning and uh, the first WhatsApp exchange that I have with my co-MD uh, normally starts at 7.30 because, I mean, what do you do? You, you get up, you take a shower, you brush your teeth and then you start working. Um, so the, the routine is something different and I'm happy to say that I have a routine now. Um, yeah, so, so that kind of changed. Um, my hack to stay sane is uh, sports. 
Um, I realized that I uh, didn't do it the first days, but now I do yoga online classes. Uh, and Anna just shared another platform with online fitness, whatever. I have my Theraband uh, pulled out of my cabinet that was there for the last five years. Probably I didn't touch it, but now I do like Theraband tr training again to just, and it, it really helps me um, to, to stay sane, but also to keep, to keep this constant exchange with everybody, also with other founders, with other um, people who are in a similar situation who also have the same fears and uh, see the same risks at the moment because a lot of them do not know how to uh, how to pay the salaries next month and and it's something that we really need to discuss because it is um, some some people have solutions and um, I mean the one the one um, uh, uh, thing that that I keep mentioning is the website of the uh, Investitionsbank Berlin, which is the, um, the, the bank that is in charge for uh, giving liquidity to companies in Berlin. And uh, they put it online on Friday and the, the website is basically down since Friday. So people cannot even request the help that the state is giving. Um, and founders and startups are really desperate. And I have so many calls each day and it's, it's really something that, I mean, you can just try to make connections to the right people it's from the Sen from the Senat, uh, from, from, you know, from the state, try to figure out who can help. Um, maybe how we can also help this, this, bank, this, this bank, because obviously they are in a digital process now that they haven't been before, um, but there are people out there with expertise in digital processes. So I hope that they will reach out to us. <laughs> <laughs> um, they're being and, tested basically yeah and and um i i hope that we will get in touch with them so, somehow but that's i mean stuff that is constantly going on this is how how my my daily life changed um, and of course for german tech i mean what we what we've been doing is um meetups and uh, open lectures and we've all been doing that uh, so far offline in our space in uh, in kreuzberg at gleisdreieck park we cannot do that anymore. So from one day to another, we had to, oh my God, he's crying, don't cry. Oh God. <laughs> um, so from one day to, we had to do that online and I'm very thankful that we are a digital company and it didn't, it wasn't too much of an, of an effort also to digitalize our corporate programs, for example, um, which a lot of our corporate clients were kind of, um, yeah afraid or critical uh, in the beginning, but um, we've done this before and it is possible to do stuff online as you can see now, and it's possible to do these connections. It's even, it even gives us a chance to connect to more people. We don't have to be in Berlin, we can be in Schleswig-Holstein or um, we had uh, another webcast yesterday where people from the US and from Italy um, can tune in and we can even connect more now that we're all at home and we're all online. Um, and that's the good thing that comes out of this whole shit. Yeah. And um, I have to say, I think it's great that we, because we're so digital and agile, I'm able to do my job. And as you say, we've been able to reach out to more people, which I think is great. And I just want to share my hack because it has to do with sports too. So it's not only to do sports, but I'm putting my sportswear right next to my bed. So if I wake up, it's the first thing I just get into so I can do it because it's also stressful to try to get that uh, into a routine. Um, and Leonie, how about you? <clears throat> yeah, I also, um, it's also sports and uh, also going out for walks because I really need this fresh air. I used to um, go with my bicycle to work and I really miss this <laughs> kind of workout because it usually takes me 30 to 40 minutes. Um, so I try to get this into my daily routine um, going out, go for a walk or jump on my bike and just go around a bit. Um, and also quite funny, um, I uh, do my sports workout is CrossFit um, and my uh, and the trainers, uh, they also do now online uh, videos and, and workouts. And as I don't have the equipment at home, they also give you hacks how you can do that. So I, <laughs> a couple of days ago, I worked out, uh, I did my workout with a box of uh, water bottles, um, trying to uh, find out how many bottles I need to put in so it's heavy enough, but not too heavy. 
So this is my sports workout. And also um, in terms of work, uh, we've established uh, two um, team calls per day, one in the morning. Um, we used to do that anyways. Um, also before, we always have a check-in in the morning. Um, but now we also have one in the afternoon. Um, and of course, there is also a lot of interaction in between. I was going to ask, um, Leonie, just so the, the attendees are aware, I mean, Grace is an accelerator, so you have a lot of co-working probably. How has that affected you guys in organizing or helping your startups? Yeah. So, I mean, we're not the typical accelerator where you go on a batch and be with us for a couple of months. Um, so at the moment, we don't have any live programs. Um, what we do have is, of course, events. Um, so we're also shifting that now um, and uh, going uh, going on uh, digital formats. So I'm happy to exchange with you afterwards how that setup worked out <laughs> um, because we still want to um, engage, of course, with, uh, with uh, people and want uh, people to get in, in uh, contact as well. So I think it's important um, to foster that um, and, and have this opportunity. Um, and also uh, what we also do is with our clients uh, that we're working with, um, um, offering new solutions, because I think it's easy to work in, in a home office situation. And I think we're also quite used to it. And I think it's also a privilege because we are in a position to have that and to be able to work from home, having all this infrastructure and so on. I think uh, many people don't have that. Um, but I think the hardest point is besides this working from home and interacting to really work deeply on, on topics, on processes, on, we work a lot in this um, whole um, innovation and, and new products thinking. Um, so um, we actually started to uh, work on, on digital formats to facilitate online design sprints, online prototyping stuff and so on. Um, and I'm curious um, how this will um, go further, but um, we do our best to um, bring everything online. And I think it's also for team leaders out there, a big challenge um, to stay in, in a good stay, not only staying in touch with the team, but also motivating them, getting them to work on stuff and even start um, projects that you might think, okay, we can't do this now, but I think it's actually possible. Yeah. No. So um, I'm really happy to hear that everyone's finding their own way to ground themselves in these times. And obviously the talk is about female entrepreneurship and investment and how we can strengthen each other and help each other. I, I think especially now we see a huge female workforce out there. I think they said it's about 80% of the workforce is female. If it's the cashier at the supermarket, it's the nurses. And all of them, uh, or many of them, are also mothers at the same time. And they're kind of multitasking and trying to float the boat and the economy and our healthcare system and everyone else. So what I'd like to do is because we, you know, it's, it's, I want to end everything always on a motivational note, but it also means we have to ask some of our um, more deeper questions is I would like for you to maybe share if you have an experience, do you ever have a negative experience, at least when it comes to your gender, maybe female, just being female? or female entrepreneur or female in the investment space um, that made you think differently about us having to support each other and push each other? Have you ever had an experience where you're like, that needs to change and I, I can't stand up to that or for that? Anyone want to share? <laughs> Anna, can you repeat the question? Like, what is it specifically? So the, the question is, have you ever had a negative experience? being a female anything um and what what would you do in the future to change that or are doing now to change that um maybe um i, I start on that when i actually started working on an investor which is scarily long ago in 2002 um because i was at a private equity fund before 
I started with AUXO. There were actually funds in Germany who explicitly said um, that women cannot invest. And I remember talking in talking to headhunters, again, this is quite some time ago, that they we went through the list of funds who were hiring and they told me, this one is got, not going to hire you as a woman, this one will. Um, which was, I was very young, straight out of university and couldn't believe it, but um, then I sort of applied to a fund which didn't think that way. I think when I um, realized that I wanted to support um, female founders, but also female investors is when I, after having worked as an investor for, um, for 13 years, actually, and I started and, um, and I had my first child, this one is the third, by the way, sort of, um, he, that um, I spoke to my yeah. former partners about um, an investment and about wanted to talk about an opportunity. Mm. And they actually said, Fabiola, you're now a mother and looking after the children. So why are you calling us? And, um, and that to me was in a way more shocking because um, it, it was people who knew me really well and still thought that now sort of I wasn't in a way didn't um, talk to me in the same way um, <clears throat> and that's when I realized that I wanted to make it to show that um, it's of course possible to have a family and continue the job you did before and in a way um, I think you can oh, even yeah, do it, tough. Um, Anna, <laughs> You can even sort of you become more organized and this um, you grow as a person so I think you um, you can become better at your work and but that's when I realized that you need more women um, it's easier if you have women around you who are in a similar situation because they they won't have these prejudices so um, that's one of the was one of the initial motivations behind um, AUXO and behind we set up a network of um, female angels for example to be able to share experiences and have more um, uh, yes, it does increase the number of people in similar situations. Wonderful. Thank you for sharing that. Maybe, I don't know, Grace or Maria, Grace, Leonie or Maria. Maybe. Should I maybe add? Go ahead. Yes, please. I think um, one of the things that Fabiola mentioned is, is one of the reasons I really want to be an entrepreneur and why I endure these crazy struggles and these up and downs. And um, it's, I think one of the main reasons I am this is I want to be independent and I don't want to face men or women as bad bosses and somehow feel um, being put down because of gender or what, whatever. So I think my interactions where I felt discriminated as a woman is not so big because I was always independent. But I do also, for example, from our investors, comments like, oh, Maxi, you should get a co-founder who's not a mom. I think it's meant to be supportive because they don't want to put too much uh, pressure on me. But it's the mindset that uh, bothers me a little bit, that they believe that you as a mom are automatically less efficient or less capable of running a business. I mean, it's, we have less time, but in my experience, the time I have, I have never been as efficient as now as a mom because I get everything done in four hours, which I got done before maybe in eight. I mean, it's a bit more like the density gets, gets higher. And uh, after the transition from Ruby Cup to Femna, I was basically in like a, I don't know, I also struggled, struggled figuring out what I wanted. And I met people and also other male founders. And some of the comments were, Maxi, you should go into consulting because you should learn like how to work in a structured way and how to uh, make processes. And this was after I built like a million revenue company and uh, obviously had some kind of idea about how to create processes and how to how to create a successful company. And I, I don't know if these comments would have been made if uh, I was a man, but it felt like, I don't know, that I'm sometimes not being taken serious because of the fact that I'm a woman. 
luckily these incidences I have, they are very, very rare. But um, I think because I know the world is as it is, that was the main reason or is one of the main reasons I really, really want to keep my independency and I want to keep and stay an entrepreneur because I don't want to deal with these, uh, with basically that discriminatory shit out there. And it, it's a fact, it does exist. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so that's my, my experiences. Leonie or Maria, anything that you guys wanna? Yeah, um, I, can, um, I can add something because um, I, I joined this, um, well, I'm lucky, I'm super lucky that, uh, I mean, I've had a corporate career before I, um, before I started working in the whole startup uh, scene 10 years ago. And um, I was always super lucky and I never had the feeling that I was discriminated against because I was a woman. Um, and I have to admit that I'm one of these women who I, I was like, okay, come on girls, it's not that bad because I never experienced it myself. Um, I started experiencing it myself um, when I started having the title managing director on my card um, because on my business card because um, now that when we get requests for panels or discussions or anything, um, they, they keep asking, when, when I get the request, it's always, yeah, um, we would like to have you on the panel because of diversity, um, which I also think they, I, I, it, when it comes from males, I think they want to do something good and they think they promote us or they think they have to do it. But at the same time, what I'm hearing is, okay, we only invite you because of your gender and because of your sex. And that is, and that is something that really, really keeps bothering me that I keep these, uh, keep getting the, these invitations where I think, okay, guys, if you don't want me um, because I, because you think I'm, I'm, you know, I'm skilled and I know what I do and I know what I tell you, um, I don't want to join. Um, so I kept, I, I, what I do now is that I keep um, answering very, very honestly, hey guys, I'm coming, but I'm not only coming because of my gender, but I'm coming because um, I know what I'm talking about and uh, I will kick ass at the stage. Um, and I think that more women should not be so much, you know, I, a lot of women are so thankful when they keep been invited to, uh, to panels and stuff like that. And we shouldn't be that um what is the i don't know the english word is like modest or thankful or whatever we should we have to be more bold so that's something that i think we could can learn more from uh from our male colleague um yeah more boldness please leonie danke maria um <clears throat> so i um keep on thinking a lot about the topic unconscious bias um because i think um, also that I don't have this huge negative experience where I said I really feel discriminated um, but I think that there are these very tiny things in um, in the way like men would see a woman um, in terms of reactions I mean come on how often have you been called too emotional for instance or um, some other kind of behavioral things where I sometimes was in the position where I thought, okay, you wouldn't say that to a man probably, but you say that to me. And um, that's when I don't feel comfortable. Um, and I tried this, um, there is a, a website, The Catalyst, and they um, started to have a tool for, to kind of detect unconscious bias um, in, the, in your texts and stuff. And they had this um, layers where, um, for instance, a word like emotional is described, but if you would turn it, it's turning to passionate. You are passionate about something and you keep on pushing for it, right? Um, but sometimes you rather hear you are emotional or you are traumatic. Um, and I think these are the little things that come up really naturally and we're all not free of unconscious bias, of course. Um, I think that counts for men and for women. And I was actually forced a couple of years ago in my previous job to start a network for uh, women 
Um, and I really questioned that when we started. I was like, okay, why do we do that? I don't see the point um, because I rather want men and women to have a network. Um, but what I do see and saw is that there is something different when you put women only in a room and you have this space. It's it's different. I'm it's it's hard to describe, but that's also something I see in our programs where we say, okay. The program is for female only. Of course, we have uh, male uh, mentors and also and, and coaches, um, but it's a different way of interaction. Um, and I think it's um, important to have that. Um, but my my biggest goal is actually to unite the different uh, networks and and platforms and really get this diverse way of working together and trying to work on this unconscious bias. And I think um, that's something uh, we can all contribute to because we're all not free of it. I think that was, um, that was a really great ad. I just quickly want to share uh, just my story really quick because uh, I think it also matters to have a really good team around you. And I had an event, it's mostly like males, like in the past, it's mostly all males. Uh, and one of them basically at the end of the night was joking around, he was like, to your place or my place? And I immediately went to my boss at the time because I was so appalled, like I couldn't even believe it. You know, I've been running around all day organizing it. And I was appalled that he would put, that person would put me in a position or look at me in that way. And I told my you know, boss at the time, and he's like, he's out, he's blacklisted. He's not allowed to our events anymore. And for me, that was a very um, empowering, or I think that was the type of response that was needed um, in my collective like management group to be like, that's not, you know, behavior like that is not allowed at all. Um, and it's not just females for females, as you say, but also, you know, males for male, everyone for each other. Um, and speaking of that, and you, you mentioned diversity, what do you guys think are these tools that we need to not only obviously push each other forward, but to push diversity forward? I can pose it to anyone. Yeah, maybe <laughs> diversity forward. Um, another a, a thought related to that, Anna, is um, diversity. It's also connected to what Fabiola talked about in the fundraising process. So um, what has been on my mind recently is how do I want to run my business and how what kind of money do I want to get in? And um, we had this discussion, Fabiola, about like cap tables, for example. And what I came to realize is that I think the way we fund businesses in Germany in this kind of venture capitalist scene is very predefined. Like there's certain rules how your cap table needs to look at certain events, otherwise you don't get money. And what I realized is that I don't want to be part of this predefined kind of structured fundraising and how you want to run your business kind of game because it, it also puts a lot of pressure, I think, on founders. And um, I think, Maria, you, you know this as well, and Anna, from the social entrepreneurship scene, what I learned, for example, is that there is a million ways to roam and a million ways how to create a successful business. And I was just wondering always where this kind of logic comes from. Also the logic that one only one out of 10 businesses is successful. My theory is this kind of logic comes from this kind of venture capital mm -hmm. uh, scene and that way of running a business. But from if you look at the social impact lab or the impact hub, I can see that much, much more businesses are successful than only one out of 10, but they are being run differently. Mm -hmm. So I've been thinking a lot about like this um, fundraising, how to run your business uh, kind of logic, because what it did to me, and I don't know if it's like a male dominated way of, of, of creating businesses, I think it scares people off. So what it did to me is like, the saying that only one out of 10 businesses are successful is a very scary number 
And um, after I quit RubyCop and I, I decided to, to run Femna, I was very highly in doubt if the second business I would create could be successful because I was so lucky that the first business I created was maybe one of the one out of 10. Mm -hmm. But it turns out that my second business is also growing and flourishing. And I'm just so highly in doubt of that number. And I'm always wondering where it comes from and if that comes from this kind of either extreme success or big fail kind of logic. And um, I recently read a book, book that's written by um, Noemi Ruland by the TDD founders and Lisa Jaspers and it's called um, Starting a Revolution where they're questioning this whole kind of way of fundraising and way of doing business. And their theory is that it's like that alpha male, alpha dominated behavior is rewarded in this typical kind of uh, venture capitalist fundraising scene where you always need an answer to every single question that is being posed, where there's no room for showing uh, insecurities or saying, I don't know yet, I'll have to figure it out, it will be tested. And so um, I don't know how much this is related to diversity or gender and male versus uh, female ways of running a business, but this has been on my mind recently because we have been in this fundraising game. And I think through this process, I, I realized that I need to do it my way and it has to feel good and I have to be able to follow the growth that the company is, is, is doing. And so I've been thinking a lot about this VC kind of game and many VCs that I've been in touch with, as we, Vaviola also mentioned, if you look at the website, it's 99% male. The only woman on that website is the secretary or the head of communications or, and maybe that kind of logic or how startups are getting funded. Maybe, maybe it's, yeah, maybe it's, it is a gender topic. Maybe, I don't know. I just wanted to put it out there because this, this is like one of the biggest thing that has been on my mind. And I'm so happy that I took the decision for myself not to want to be part of this game. And that's also connected again to this wanting to stay independent, you know, not being dependent on any, any external people that tell you how to, how to do what, what you actually, what you know best, you know? Mm -hmm. So I think those are, it, it's like a two part thing. The one was, uh, you know, how does diversity play a role and how can we um, push it forward even more uh, with certain strategies? But the other questions that you actually posed, I think for maybe Leonie and Fabiola, maybe you guys have insights into um, Fabiola, you know, do you see um, that more gender neutral BC companies might perform better because they have a different culture and maybe for Leonie, because you guys are focused on, or not focused, maybe the Grace Accelerator has a better uh, outcome of enterprises being successful because you guys think differently than, you know, maybe a very uh, alpha driven accelerator. Um, leave it to either one of you. If an input to that. Um, yes, maybe I just, I think there's sort of, there's a number of questions in, um, in what we are discussing right now. And I think one point Leonie actually made earlier is the question of whether subconscious biases are leading towards um, different type of decision making towards men and women. And I think, it's, um, I'm sorry, it's getting louder here. <laughs> Um, so, um, and there are studies that show that bias leads to, that there is a sort of inherent bias in this as well. We can hear you really well, so don't worry about it. Like, your, the, your voice is fine, so don't worry about it. Unless the internet plays tricks with us. Um, yeah. So, <sighs> nice freeze, though. I think we lost you, Fabiola. Can you hear me? We can't. I lost you for a second. Maybe we'll wait for you to just get um, set up before maybe Leonie, maybe you want to take the 
chance now. Yeah, I, can, I can jump in uh, until Fabiola is, is uh, settled again. Um, and it's actually also a topic that uh, I've discussed with Fabiola and, and, and the other um, team members of OXO as well. I think um, also there is a couple of topics in this. Uh, one thing is, um, and what I really see in, in the women who start with Grace is that the way of building a company um, often doesn't fit the expectation of a VC um, because it's rather a focus on building a sustainable company with a sustainable um, approach to, in, um, to, to build it up, um, also in terms of numbers and in, in terms of how to build a team. Um, and this doesn't often doesn't correspond with the idea of um, venture capital where you have this very high exponential growth um, that investors want to see um, because that's the way they get the money back with a return, of course. But if you build your company differently and it's not built on the goal to exit in two years or do an IPO in five years or whatever, or 10, um, then it's different. And I think often the expectations um, are not met, be it either the, um, the, the way you want to build your company, but I think also the way um, you approach how you build your company. And I think there is, of course, a lot of stereotypes in um, um, how founders are seen. Um, and you have this, and I think that's for male and female as well. Um, and um, I think if you don't fit this expectation, um, investors are a bit more, um, sorry, I have difficulties finding the right words, um, hesitant to invest in you because if you don't represent what they expect, they have to ask more questions or wrap their head around it. And um, I think that's because for me, like the stereotype founder for years was a guy coming from a famous business school um, with a team of two or three other guys. Um, and this is what, what you would expect if you see um, uh, a startup founding team, right? Um, and I think that this is changing quite a lot. And also in terms of diversity, um, not only gender related, but also having founders coming from all kind of backgrounds starting their companies um, it's something that is developing but I think in terms of expectations it often doesn't fit the expectations probably um, investors have to, to add to that I, I, um, I think that this is a, um, a challenge or a task that is um, on us for the next years to come um, male, female, whatever gender you are. Um, and uh, I don't know if you've been following the discussions, unicorns versus zebras. I think that is, um, that is something that, that, that will help us because um, just for those of you who don't know, yeah. um, for, do, do you want to? No, I was just going to say, for those who don't know about yeah, the- For those of you who don't know in the startup, uh, world, a unicorn is um, a startup that is valued by 1 billion and more. Um, and there is a movement. Um, I think it's in Europe so far. I haven't seen any, any startups from other countries calling themselves zebras yet. Um, zebras are the ones that are not trying to become unicorns, but are rather concentrating on building a sustainable business, which means um, it is not only black or white so we do good then we are an NGO or uh, we make as much money as possible then we are um, trying to get become a unicorn but we are black and white so we we are trying to build uh, sustainable business models but meanwhile also helping the world getting uh, to get a, to become a better place uh, and I think this is this is a, a change in the mindsets of the VCs that we that we need to foster uh, and all the investors even angels um, I had this discussion with uh, people from the European Union, from the European Commission, um, that we have to stop hunting for these unicorns because they, they, they don't help anybody. Um, they, they, um, 
they get way too much attention when, when we are talking about startups. Uh, it's always talking about these unicorns. Um, but the backbone of, uh, of the startup scene are, are zebras and startups that are not valued by a million, but are uh, paying their costs and uh, building, um, having, uh, having their employees paid and, and building good products to, to help us. Um, and I hope that of the whole Corona thing, um, that it will help us to even realize that more, that we don't need more WeWorks and Ubers, um, but we need more Femnas. <laughs> and graces and outsource and maybe Fabiola, do you want to try to uh, take a, a second run? And yeah, I would like to try to take a second run because I agree with a lot of um, what Leonie and Maria have said, but maybe in answer to your question, Anna, I think for me the biggest tool needed in a way is, um, is, um, is education, and that we talk to a lot of founders and they haven't quite understood they, I think sort of people are mixing definitions and you talk, they're calling something VC money that maybe is not VC money. And um, so what, we've, what I feel helps most and what founders should do is really think about the type of founder they want to be, what values they have, what their business model is going to look like and what type of money is the right type of money for the business model. So um, what I think is very important that you find that you say financing is not a business model chasing a VC funding. It's actually finding the right financing for your business model. And, um, and then I think the VC world, um, and I'm very excited about, I've, I read this book too about um, starting a revolution and the Zebra discussion and um, I've been a member of the Ashoka support network since 2009 and so I've been, if you look, I think there are many impact funds out there actually doing really great things and they investing in cases that the sort of Zebra is a new term but really a lot of funds have actually looked for that that you say you have impact KPIs and financial KPIs as well so I think there's a lot of really exciting things happening out there um, and it's sort of the, the typical VC case that's the one we're looking for um, it's I think the number Maxi you mentioned is that one out of ten companies only working um, I think what it's sort of the way I understand this number is that one out of ten investments is the one that has this exponential growth so that it works from an investor's perspective because the VCs are actually putting in quite a lot of money for very high valuations. So um, they do need this exponential growth to be able to, um, to repay the fund. It's looking at what I'm trying to say is um, that sort of it's, if, you, if you try to understand the way the different types of investors think, then um, I think it's easier to find the right model for you. And there's, but there's a lot of interesting debate out there. And for us as also, it means that we are very excited about, we are trying to find a place between the typical impact investor and the typical VC. Mm -hmm. Because what we're trying to say is that we, um, we, um, we don't want to invest in exponential growth, but we want to invest in sustainable growth. And that we're looking for a type of founder who has, we still need to work on the wording, but has some sort of progressive DNA, has what we call a progressive DNA. And that means that um, the founders, that they're purpose-driven, they believe in diversity and new work models, um, all these things. And so we are very excited about trying to define what it means and um, happy to discuss that with anybody who wants to join this discussion. I love the terminology, progressive DNA. It's one of those things that through all our talks, we get to pick up all these nice terms. Um, and also, Fabiola, I, was gonna, uh, I wanted to add to that. What, what is interesting to me, even in the clean tech space, when you look at VCs, VCs are highly competitive with each other. And the more VCs and density of different venture capitalists you have, I think inevitably a team has to pick the right fit. So if the team is highly successful, and they know themselves well enough, they would hopefully, I mean, go towards a VC 
that is looking more in terms of the long run and the health of the startup and the health of the investment. So I think um, in terms of looking at uh, a diverse VC that is, as you say, looking at, um, what was it, DNA, progressive DNA? Mm -hmm. um, progressive DNA, yeah, that term actually is, really comes from Leonie and her, um, oh, Leonie, developed it in a joint session. So can only recommend when you're trying to find your strategy, talk to, um, talk to Leonie and um, Yes, and maybe just one thing I wanted to add is the what's happening now. For me, one of the main questions I'm asking myself with Corona is what's going to happen um, what's going to happen now because we were really excited beforehand that we saw this shift in thinking even with traditional investors. You know, you see large institutions suddenly um, saying sustainability is going to become more important, all this, and um, somehow my biggest worry is that the corona and the financial crisis now coming out of this is um, is sort of is it going to shift the focus away from you know from what we had achieved in terms of getting um, getting traditional investors to rethink their goals and rethink their ESG impact criteria and all this sort of um, yeah, I think that's going to be sort of what's going to happen there is the whole climate debate. Is it going to stay in focus or is it going to um, have less of a priority? And I really hope that kind of what we developed on the sustainability and impact side, that it's still, I hope you're not going to regress from that. So, um, yeah. And that's, I think, one of the questions we sort of this whole Corona, um, corona financial consequences, we're going to have to see what's happening. And I hope at least we want to stick to our impact, um, to our impact goals. And I think what would be interesting in, in terms of that too, is that we can always reconvene in the next two months um, and see what have the outcomes been and how have things been changing, whether it's positive or uh, negative, uh, hopefully more positive for everyone. I just want to let our attendees know really quick that there's a Q&A button at the bottom uh, in case anyone wants to ask another question before we end this wonderful panel breakfast. Uh, but for all our panelists as well, if you guys want to add anything or ask any more questions, I am opening up the talk. Go ahead, Maxi. And I, have, I, I have a question for Fabiola. So um, how is it from an investor's point of view at the, at the moment? Um, I read Sequoia Capitals, for example, warning uh, other VCs to invest right now because we are facing one of the biggest recessions ever. And um, like my question is, is there any point in also investing anti-cyclical or what it, does it mean for startups needing to raise money now? Is RVCs or are investors extremely scared, afraid of investing money or does it make sense even to invest money now in times of recession? I guess there's theories about that too or what's like maybe you can talk about from your perspective or what it does it mean for the startups or the entrepreneurs that are joining this discussion? like. How is the fundraising game in times of crisis actually go uh, looking? Well, I think with um, Corona, we've been in, say, I'm going to call it the lockdown period now for two weeks. So in a way, I think it's very, it's a little bit our Berlin scene that sort of everybody, it's not like the, um, we have talked to the VCs, we've talked to, Giza is very active in the startup verband. And, but from my point of view, it's um you know it's it's a question of keeping calm and seeing nobody has the answers yet and what the v investors are all doing is looking after portfolio companies so um i think for the typical vc investor and what we first thing we did is um talk to our portfolio is are we is there anybody who's going to have immediate cash issues or liquidity issues um and so I think it's too early to actually see what type of policy is going to 
be derived. I think the first VCs are saying it's an opportunity for valuations to go down. It's been, from an investor's point of view, it's been a founder-friendly environment on the whole. Um, for us with fundraising, we're asking ourselves the, from the LP side, they've sort of, because the public markets have gone down so much, they think in terms of allocation. So they're not going to, um, it's, it's sort of how the allocation is going to look in a few weeks, it's unclear. So it's, it's hard to make recommendations. I would think as a founder, be, to my recommendation to founders is be really conservative, you know, um, sort of try to prepare for, um, make sure, you know, that your run rate is as long as it can get. So you have time to just to give it a few weeks to see how, you, yes, how things are developing. I'm sorry, I can't give you very much sort of, um, I think nobody has the clarity right now. Super interesting. I think that valuations are going down. So this should be a business opportunity for investors. Yeah, of course. I think, I mean, from, an, from a purely investor point of view, if you, um, and that's what we're seeing already, and what, um, for, starting from the big hedge funds, everybody down, is obviously the a recession is the best time to invest, because that's when you get assets the cheapest. Mm -hmm. And let's keep in mind, the teams aren't necessarily changing, and the ideas aren't digressing either. So, is there... Um, Maria or Le Leonie, any more last thoughts you guys would like to share with us? Because I know some have to leave soon, so. Um, yeah, so, yeah, I just, uh, I mean, I can just uh, second what, what Leonie is saying. I mean, we are working a lot uh, with corporate also, and um, it is way too early to make any, um, I, I would not take any decisions yet or, or, or change something. Um, because we are super fresh into this new situation. And I still have a little bit of hope that everything turns out not as bad as um, as we think it might be. If, I mean, I don't know if you're listening to uh, the podcast of Dr. Drossen, um, the top virologist of the, um, of the Charité here in Berlin. Um, if the lockdown or the shutdown or whatever you want to call it, um, if it works, and we can slow down the virus, we will be back to whatever will be the new normal very fast. Um, so there is hope. And um, that's, that's what I would, would count on as a, as a founder and as a startup at the moment. Of course, there are um, huge challenges on the short term now, but I think there are also, there, there's this huge solidarity and, and so many people that are willing to help um, at the moment, and I hope that this will be a spirit that we can um, build on even after the direct crisis is over and we are into recession or whatever. Um, as I, I still hope it will not be that bad. And the very, very good thing for us, for all of us, is that, uh, and that's something that I'm sure of, that there is nobody out there in this country anymore that can deny that digitalization will help us to stay connected to exchange to um to, to build better products um, because that's what we will be doing at least for the next two two weeks um and we will prove that it works um, we are proving that it works um so we we as the digital scene of germany um we can see this as a chance to finally have our proof of concept um and this will be a good chance for us to to take it off from there and I'm, I'm jumping in on that because um, I, I know we're coming to an end and uh, it's probably different than a live Q&A where you exchange directly with the audience. Um, but maybe it's possible either to share our um, contact details afterwards and also let's stay connected um, in the next uh, weeks, um, having a digital coffee or going for a walk together on the phone or whatever. Um, and I also want to invite all the, um, all the people who are listening to, to, um, to us at the moment, um, because I think we're all, there are a lot of uncertainties for all of us um, and we can't change that, but I think in staying connected and exchanging, uh, about different topics um, can also help us to stay sane 
and also to keep on going once uh, we can act uh, better again um, and and being more active again um, and and using that as as a possibility to go um, through this time and also making um, um, important connections even when we are kind of locked away <laughs> from everything so i think that would be nice um, if that happens and um, yeah maybe sharing contact details or feel free to contact me on linkedin or um, whatever channel is possible wonderful um, unless anyone else has anything to add i see a few people are uh, chatting right now. And I know on our, our event, right, we also have your LinkedIn profiles. So I would encourage anyone that wants to, you know, directly connect with anyone on the panel, go to the LinkedIn and try to connect via that with, you know, subject exchange breakfast with German tech. I'm very happy and so glad you guys could make it, uh, especially under these harsh or harsh these circumstances. But I also believe that um, the idea of, you know, community healing, which I really like and that we're kind of taking all these positives and hopefully, as Maria said, we won't forget about them uh, if the situation is alleviated soon. And uh, in that, I would be more than happy if we reconvene again in, in another month or two and we can see what's happening and how things have positively changed for all of us. So, danke schön. Thank you very much. All the panelists. And hopefully we will talk soon. And thank you for all the attendees. And yeah, thanks for, to everybody. We'll be in touch. Thank you. Bye-bye, guys. Have a lovely day. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.